Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, from Gia. It, it is great to be in Sao Paulo again. Yes, again. The first time I was lucky to be here was in September 2000, some 16 years ago. Then I was on my way to a conference in Rio Claro. A few years later, in 2004, I had been invited by the organizers of the 8th Congress of Brasileiro de Abrisasso Urbana to give a lecture about aspects of garden culture and open space development in Germany. And today, I feel happy to celebrate with you the 40th anniversary of the ABAP, the Associação Brasileira das Arquitetos Paisagistas. Happy anniversary to all of you. The 2004 image you see is from the relatively affluent Sumarayan neighborhood across Sao Paulo. And in the upper right, you see a concrete bridge elements rope connection. It's a detail from a Knüppelbrücke, a state bridge in the Praça de Luz Park in Sao Paulo. We go. For me, this bridge has symbolic meaning with respect to my long-standing relationship to Sao Paulo. It dates back to the early 1970s when I met Felisberto Caballero, my first Paulista, and who became a friend of our family. Unfortunately, Professor Felisberto, whom you see here next to the Arvore de Libertad in Rio Claro, died way too early in 2003. Now, as indicated, in Germany we call this stick bridge a Knüppelbrücke. A Knüppel is a crooked piece of wood, often oak. Some 100 years ago, such Knüppelbrücken, stick bridges, were fashionable elements in parks and gardens. However, as these bridges were made of wood, they needed some maintenance. If not, they would tend to rot away. So then, after the invention of steel-reinforced concrete in 1867 by the French gardener Joseph Monnier, we would replace earlier wooden bridges by new and fashionable steel-reinforced concrete bridges. However, as we loved these earlier natural bridges so much, we would not build newly designed steel-reinforced concrete bridges, but would shape the concrete and imitate a crooked wooden structure. More so, although the steel-reinforced concrete needed no roping, we would imitate ropes. Of course, the much more elegant bridge in the Praxa de Luz here. I need some light. <laughs> Imitates rope connected bamboo. Anyway, to cut the story short, these ropes, steel reinforced concrete bridge elements, somehow represent my connection to Sao Paulo. In Berlin, in Germany, where I come from, it is early autumn, and so it's nice for me as a European to get another chance to prolong my summer somewhat in Sao Paulo and in Varens. Thank you very much to Patricia Santana and the members of the organizational team for this fourth International Congress of Landscape Architecture in Brazil and Shelter City. I believe I know how much work needs to be done to get such a Congress going. Thank you also very much to Professor Eliana Goraldo for the opportunity to talk to you about urban horticulture in edible landscapes. I wish I could speak Portuguese, but I have to admit I cannot. Nevertheless, I should say I'm always fascinated by the sound of the Brazilian Portuguese and I like to listen to it. So please accept that I continue in English. Obrigado. As a gardener, I'm convinced that gardens can do a lot to make the world more peaceful. I believe gardens can help to shape a peaceful future in an urbanizing world. These three maps allow to see the change from open space to build up space in Beijing and China between 1975 and 2002, and this continues. At present, plans are underway to accommodate some 20 million people in the Beijing area. Worldwide, an ever-increasing percentage of the population will assemble in cities. And this is how the western suburbs of Sao Paulo, Brazil, look from the air in the early 21st century. High-rises gradually replace one-family housing, 
some of the open spaces still remain. And this 1999 drawing indicates the expected spatial development between Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in the early 21st century. Now just to indicate the scale of the social and spatial issues at stake, here is a comparison between Beijing and Tianjin with about 40 million people in China, some 150 kilometers apart, and Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro with again some 40 million people who live about 400 kilometers apart. And as a reminder only, the rapid decrease of the Mata Atlantica, the unique Brazilian forest along much of the Atlantic coast. Within 500 years, it decreased from more than 1 million square kilometers to about 4,000 square kilometers. Brazil is one of those locations on the world map where a lot more urban urbanization is to be expected. Now, as we humans tend to find cities and their environs preferable to remote locations in the countryside, I believe gardens are appropriate expressions of such an urbanizing world. My lecture today consists of five parts. And first, I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is civilization only which creates gardens. In the second part, I will very briefly refer to Roman urban garden culture. In the third and longest part, I will have a look at gardens as elements of urban open space systems and garden city ideals. In the fourth part, I point to some issues which reflect aspects of edible gardens or landscapes in an urbanizing world. And in my fifth and final part, I very briefly touch upon gardens as elements in future-oriented architectural designs. Now, Mildenus has no gardens. Those who garden express a sensitivity which has been generated, promoted, and communicated as a result of cognitive achievement. Gardens first appear as human ideas which then become implemented in a myriad of culturally coined ways. The spatial arrangement of elements, which commonly are labeled a garden, is one of many or only. This local gardener carefully selected his plot and cleared it in a tropical forest in Kerala in South India. Derivated from the highly civilized art of glass framing, dream gardens, such as represented in the glass window in an insurance building in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, opened the path into the realm of fantasy, imagination, and invention. This string garden follows a painting by Maxfield Parrish. It consists of more than 100,000 pieces of tinted glass produced 100 years ago in 1916 by the famous glass company of Louis Comfort Tiffany from New York City. Fantasy Imagination and invention also relate to the worlds of literature and painting. For example, in the unique and precious early 20th century garden images by Raymond Charmaison. In Paris, France, they inspired the symbolists, a literary group with Stéphane Mallarmé as their focus. There are, as reflections upon a highly urbanized and globalized world, books in which gardens serve both as metaphors and realities for contemporary urban existence. One example is an unusual and fascinating book from Korea. Its title is Oredon Yongwon, or translated, The Old Garden. Its author, Wang Sok Yong, tells a very up-to-date story about life in both Koreas in the second half of the 20th century. Small vegetable gardens in a rural area and in an urban prison environment serve as reality and metaphor for short moments of happiness and harmony which are commemorated lifelong. The book relates to Berlin, Germany, and I felt attracted by the outstanding literary quality of the book and its many relations to gardens. The image you see here in between the Korean and the German book covers is from Yogi-san, Community Good Garden, in Seoul, South Korea. A, sense, a sentence in Wang Sok-yong's book from a conversation between two Koreans in Berlin 
Mercy of me may serve as a motto for my presentation today, and I quote. From my point of view, civilization can only become changed by the endeavor to have a regard for both humans and gardens. Now, save one word, this is a precise quotation. However, I replace the word nature with the word garden. Garden served as elements, <coughs> excuse me, Gardens as elements of an urbanizing world can serve as successful examples for such endeavor. Early gardens we know of belong to urban civilization. In 3300 BCE, there was a flourishing garden culture in the Sumerian metropolis of Uruk in Mesopotamia, some 50, of some 50,000 people. One third of the area of this ancient city on the eastern banks of the Euphrates River was gardens. I believe you could call this an edible landscape by Sajan Komisivet. Excavations by the German Archaeological Institute and its Bagdad department began in large scale in 1928 in Europe and have not yet been finished. In order to get an idea of what the site at Europe may have looked like, I show you this image from an edible landscape along the banks of the Regiel Dutkwa in Tongia in Pohoko. Other early gardens belong to the cities of the Egyptian pharaohs, such as the garden next to a moon temple in Karnak, Luxor, shown on Senever's tomb from around 1400 BCE at Karnak. Senever is believed to have been the mayor of the image you see here was discovered in 1828 by the Italian Egyptologist Ippolito Rossellini, who made a copy of it. And I will briefly explain what you can see in this edible garden image. <laughs> Thank you. You see around, it's surrounded by, by trees. It's all around here, you see the trees here. If you have a closer look at it, you can see different palm trees, one which branch off, one which has a straight stem. You can see here a big vineyard in here. And you see some water basins with fowl and papyrus plants and anything. And you see the processing sheets where the uh, fruit is harvested. You can talk a full hour about this image. I just wanted you to get a rough um, interpretation. It's all about eating about edible fruit. The earliest written evidence we have for a gardener seems to be a hieroglyph from the old kingdom of Egypt, which roughly covered the period of the second half of the third millennium BCE. And again, when you have a closer look at the hieroglyph, you see here the vine again. And you see the support for the vine here. And over here, you see the water basin and the plants and the water fountain in there. Again, there's much more to it. There's been a German who wrote an entire book about this um, tourist. As the Romans went to Egypt in 30 BCE and also conquered Greece in 146 CE, such early knowledge about gardens as part of urban civilization moved north across the Mediterranean towards Italy and many other European countries. The Villa Adriana in Tivoli, built between 118 and 134 CE, with its Canopus area from Alexandria, Egypt, is just one example. There are no crocodiles in Italy, but there is one on the Canopus area in Tivoli. You see it here on the right. And the story goes like this. The husband of a couple had left home for many days and his wife felt lonely. So after a while she invited a lover to their home. He would enjoy a bath in the pool adjacent to the home. Once the husband learned about this habit of the lover of his wife, he arranged for a crocodile to be brought into the pool. There's another story to this crocodile, which you can read in Marguerite Yursenar's 1951 book, Miguel at Lyon. Some of the water brought to Rome via aqueducts helped to irrigate gardens. 
Early in this Roman civilization, water provision for urban gardens was a cardinal problem. In 184 BC, already Cato the Elder lost sympathy as censor when he short-handedly stopped the illegal tapping of public supplies for urban garden irrigation. Sextus Julius Frontinus mentioned in his study, the Aqueductu Orbis Romae, about the water provision for the city of Rome. Owners of private gardens who had pulled bricks from the aqueducts and thus deviated the water to their gardens. And in some instances, this brought the flow of the water to an end before it reached its destination proper. You just imagine here, this is the canal where the water runs down here on the gardens. So the clever Romans pulled bricks out here and the water would gradually trickle down and water their gardens. The um, Horti Romani, as exemplified in the Horti Mencinatis in the ancient city of Rome, Italy, collected both orchard, Obstgarten in German, and design garden, Kunstgarten. They were outstanding examples for urban, edible, and aesthetic gardens, respectively edible and aesthetic landscapes. Still today, one can find elements of urban horticulture in densely populated areas. Here is an example from a facade ornamented with tiles with floral motifs and planted containers on a windowsill in Rome in Italy. And another example from a window plant container at Sheridan Square in Manhattan in New York City. And this is roadside gardening in Japan and Taiwan. Japanese Michibaba Henge means roadside gardening. Striking examples of gardens as elements of urbanizing world are the murals, which we know were painted on the walls of houses in the ancient cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii, a few miles southeast of Naples, Italy. The murals have been preserved because they were buried under volcanic pyroclastic flow when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE. Much later, in the second half of the 20th century, 1961 to 1984, some of these gardens became excavated by Wilhelmina Yashinsky and her team. And this 18th century painting shows pyroclastic flow from Mount Vesuvius as it destroys an edible landscape in the Campi Flagrei, a few miles west of Naples. Over thousands of years, Mediterranean garden culture also created vast edible landscapes. Here is an example of viticulture and olive cultivation from the city of Martino Franco in the Valle d'Itria in Puglia in Italy. In terms of edible gardens and landscapes, this also relates to espalier fruit, and you see here two examples from Berlin's Park and uh, on the International Green Week in Berlin. Now, over many centuries, not much did change in European cities. For a long time, gardens beyond the city walls were fairly unstable land use, as they were easy to destroy in warfare. The mid-18th century plan of Paris, France, commissioned by Michel Etienne Turgeon, gives a good idea of an edible landscape in an urbanized world. A closer look at the urban gardens reveals their vegetable, their fruit gardens, as well as especially design gardens with flowers and ornamental shrubs only. I think you can even see that. I didn't, don't have to show it precisely. In Berlin, Germany, by the 17th, late 17th century, gardens are elements of an urbanizing society and received special attention when so-called refugees, refugees from France, came to the city. When the French king had decided for religious political reasons to get rid of this well-educated group in 1685, the Prussian king invited them to come to his country that same year. And about a century later, a well-known description for Berlin from 1779 stated, and I quote, there are, especially in the more spacious suburbs of Berlin, so many gardens that it would be a very circumstantial enterprise to list and describe them all. It will remain to be seen what, if any, role gardens will play with the early 21st century refugee influx in Germany and the rest of Europe. More than that, 
In late 18th and early 19th centuries, a concept developed which formed the base for the creation of an urban horticulture, Alex and Moss. It included the cities of Potsdam and Berlin. It followed the ideas of land embellishment, Landes für Schönung, which drew from Italian, French, and English examples. Inspired by the late 18th century garden empire vision of Franz von Anhalt Dessau, landscape architect Peter Josef Lenin conceived an embellishment plan for Potsdam and its surroundings in 1833. And some aspects of this plan are still visible in Berlin and Potsdam. Well, I indicated roughly Berlin is over here, and the majority of the city, the border between Berlin and Potsdam is right here. This is Klinika Bridge, Klein Klinika Park, and over here you see Potsdam, you see the major axis, east west axis of the Sanssouci Gardens in Potsdam. And Lenné did a design which included both Berlin and Potsdam, this, this light green color you see here. On a 2013 visit to Mysore, an attack in India, I could see the Brindavan Gardens and learn about related early 20th century open space planning. There, in the south of India, Gustav Hermann Krumbiegel created some 100 years ago edible landscapes, and it's just one example. And this is another edible landscape example from Summer Town in the Adelaide Hills in South Australia. I believe there are examples in Brazil which may compare to this, however, I'm not aware of it, and Brazil is huge. As a concomitant to industrialization, many cities in Europe faced considerable open space reductions in quarters built to house people who migrated to the cities from rural areas. Here is one graphic example from Hamburg Bombing between 1867 and 1910 which indicates open space reduction. And another one from Porto Alegre and Rio Grande do Sul in a comparable time frame, which indicates open space creation southwest of the historic town center. In Berlin and elsewhere, answers to the open space question, the Freiflächenfrage, were in demand. One answer came from the United States to England and from there to Germany and other European countries. It was the idea of the Garden City. In the United States, the plan for Riverside, Illinois, drawn by the American landscape architect Frederick Holmesley, had been carefully studied by Englishman Ebenezer Howard. In his 1898 book, Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform, Howard turned the Olmsted plan into a comprehensive concept for a Garden City. Howard's book served as guideline for the first garden cities of Welwyn and Letchworth, north of London, in the United Kingdom, built in the early 20th century. Certainly, it would be of interest to learn about applications of this concept in the Brazilian states. Given the many residential developments which were said to be garden cities, I seriously doubt that Howard's thorough study found enough diligent readers as his text was accompanied by diagrams, such as the three magnets, I have the impression that quite a few had a look at these diagrams only and forget, forgot about the rest of the comprehensive text. Now, I cannot address all of the aspects Howard suggested, but want to point to some of his examples only, which included edible landscapes and fruit farms near garden cities. And Howard also suggested new forests for garden cities, I circled this, you see that here? This is the uh, scheme for the Garden City, and here he has fruit farms, and over here he suggests to have new farms. It's a scheme only, but he has this edible aspect in his plan there. Now, recently, a group of people related to urban forestry engaged to create an urban fruit park in the Northeast Valley of Los Angeles in California. And in April this year, 2016, the first Asia-Pacific Urban Forestry Meeting was organized by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, the Urban Forestry Research Center of the State Forestry Administration of the People's Republic of China, and the host city of Shuhai, Guangdong, near Macau in China. 
and it produced the July Declaration of Urban Forestry. Anyway, Howard's idea of garden cities spread, I would say seriously diluted, almost worldwide in the course of the 20th century and helped to make gardens elements of an urban world. For Chinese people, the peach blossom spring story with Tao Yanming still has a unique impact upon gardens as elements of an urbanizing world. So here you see a painting of this story by Tao Yanming. Dapling Wu village built in early 21st century in Senchu, Taiwan which I was able to visit a few months ago, may serve as an example for this ongoing interest to live in a residential neighborhood which comes close to the edible landscape of the peach blossom spreading idea. Another answer to the open space question of Eiffel and Frage came from late 19th century Germany. It was the invention of zoning. In 1875, the Prussian law for the determination of building lines was to set the legal basis for city amplifications, that is future urban land use. At the beginning of the 20th century, American planners looked for city planning examples in Germany and applied them to their cities. In New York City, for example, and I quote, the first zoning ordinances were approved in 1916, so exactly 100 years ago. Zoning plans, Bebauungspläne, as they're called in German, suggested future urban land use and included the provision of various kinds of open spaces, such as gardens, parks, cemeteries, and so on. In his profound, if mainly statistical, analysis to the urban open space problem, published in 1915, the Berlin planner Martin Wagner differentiated between various building classes, Bauklassen, and corresponding open space provision. As residential areas such as the Horseshoe Settlement in Berlin, Martin Wagner, architect Bruno Taut, and landscape architect Leverett Migge were on the road to implementation. However, when National Socialism took over in Germany in 1933, Wagner was forced to leave the country, and he never returned. In early 25th in early 20th century, plans for residential locations such as Beverly Hills in Los Angeles, California, and Nikolassee, Schlachtensee, and Wannsee in Berlin, Germany, gardens indicated an urbanizing world. However, these were answers to the resi residential interests of fairly affluent people only. Less affluent people would be lucky to have a tenant garden. Here's the mid 1920s examples of tenant gardens edible gardens for citizens in Frankfurt on Main. The uh, residential area is still around. You see the cherry trees here. These are the rows of the cherry trees there, and the people could do their own potato, cabbage, whatever they needed in the gardens there. Now, over the 20th century, less affluent petty bourgeois and poor citizens had to learn how to get organized to push for the implementation of their garden interests also. This was mentioned by one of the earlier uh, speakers here. Early on in Germany, they demanded to include their small gardens, Kleingarten, or allotment gardens, Mietergärten, tenant gardens, into the land use planning process and the resulting land use plans as part of the overall urban diversity and harmony. After more than 50 years of struggle in Germany, the allotment gardeners finally succeeded in 1965 when their gardens were included into the paragraphs of the federal building law, the Bundesbaugesetz. And ever since, they have contributed considerably to the democratic debate about urban land use. Such gardens are part of the urbanization in many countries in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere around the world. In Japan, his interest in allotment gardens started in late 19th century already, when scholars like Mori Rintaro Ogai were sent to Germany. Ogai had been sensitive to Kleingarten in his 1884 to 1888 German diary, which you see here and you see him on the left. Ogai is considered one of the uh, 100 most important Japanese for the development in Japan in the 20th century. 
when a simple interest in the Auckland Garden was precipitated in Japan in 1926. The Shirokita Koen, Osaka, Japan, included various aspects of urban horticulture. It is a good example for an edible landscape. There was a, I'll just show you. There's a school garden here, a demonstration plot. These are the individual garden plots, which would qualify as kind of allotment garden. Here you have a canal, and you can see the little black lines here, which is uh, fishing docks. And you see here flower beds, and more of an orchard, and an orchard, and a play meadow here, and a school garden down here. So it combined various aspects of edible landscapes in this 1926 plan. So the um, refresh noen in the city of Fukuoka on Kyushu is a late 20th century development garden example from Japan. And at the Takane Klein Garden site near Kobuchisawa in Japan, people not only cultivate individually their edible plants, but their communal orchard also. You can see the individual plants all over here, and this is the communal orchard, which all of them take care of. At um, Makiyama Klein Garden near Okayama, Honshu, Japan, former rice terraces were turned into allotment gardens. A 2016 urban gardening publication in Berlin lists some 70 community gardens and it even announces the edible garden activities of Julia Machado Amaral in Belo Horizonte, Minas Gerais, in Brazil. You can see here. A few weeks ago, Hans Dieter Tepp of Sao Paulo, the founder of Cidade San Fome, gave a talk about livable urban quarters, urban agriculture, stimulus for city development and city building at the uh, Central Institution for Scholarly Extension, Education and Cooperation, the Technical University of Berlin Affiliated Association. In 2016, Zidane Sanfon, founded by Temp in 2003, operated 22 community gardens in Sao Paulo, a city of 11 million people, respectively 20 million for the metropolitan region. Now roughly, this corresponds to one community garden per one million people. Also, these publications and lectures have nothing to say about other aspects of urban horticulture. And I will briefly comment on the outspoken selectiveness of such publications and lectures, which seems to be characteristic. The Berlin Urban Garden uh, publication does not mention some 35,000 allotment gardens in Berlin. In Berlin and elsewhere in Germany, these allotment gardeners and producers of edible landscapes are very well organized. They are served by journals such as the Garden Freund, Garden Friend. This journal is received by each allotment holder once a month. The Fachberater, the professional consultant, is a quarterly sent to professional consultants for allotment gardening only. In the 2016 Berlin Urban Gardening publication has nothing to say about some 75,000 urban home gardens, which are a combined of an emerging bourgeois society since late 18th century in cities in Germany. Books such as Gustav Meyer's 1860 Manual for Beautiful Garden Art carried many examples for gardens which included fruit and vegetable gardens. And again, you can see that here. You see the more ornamental part in this garden. But you see here, the garden beds are fruit and vegetable. It's the same in this proposal for another urban garden design from the 1860s. The uh, 2016 urban gardening publication has nothing to say about the 10,000 tenant gardens and a small but increasing number of roof gardens. It appears that 17 community gardens seem to be more important than 150,000 individually operated gardens. I do not mean there is anything wrong with the activities described in the urban gardening brochure for Berlin or with the activities of Sidaj Zenfam or comparable interests. However, there's much more to urban horticulture than these publications and lectures indicate. 
A SWOT analysis. SWOT stands for strengths, weakness, opportunities, threats, common in many other fields, is lacking for this kind of urban gardening. Although there's a wealth of knowledge within the allotment gardening federations and associations, here's an example from Ireland, many community gardeners still find it difficult to tap these sources. And, for whatever reasons, it seems extremely difficult to develop a broad vision for urban horticulture. On a national level for Germany, the 2013 Future Strategy Horticulture Report, edited by the German Federal Ministry for Nutrition and Agriculture, made an attempt for private enterprises, which included ornamentals, pot plants and perennials, landscape contractors, tree nurseries, fruit, vegetables and herbs, cemetery horticulture and horticulture specialist retailers. There are local, as in this example, regional, as in this example, and nationwide analyses of horticultural production which appear to be unknown to edible landscape enthusiasts. A first attempt at, more comes, at a more comprehensive view is the Vacant Lots to Wycombe Plots book published in May 2016. Instead of horticulture, it uses the misleading expression of agriculture. Nevertheless, in its scope, it is one of the few publications which reaches beyond community gardens. It does not include home gardens and other kinds of urban horticulture, however. Also, the um, Berlin publication has nothing to say about neglected urban, in quotes, agriculture, as for example here in the grassland orchard, orchard at the Velodrome in Berlin, in Germany, where 450 apple trees from France have been planted in 2000. And look at the bad shape they have. All of the several centuries of grassland orchard, orchard knowledge obviously never made it to the Prenzlauer of Bergborough in the center of Berlin, Germany. Now, here are two examples of well-maintained extensive grassland orchards. One at the canal garden of the mid-18th century Eremitage in Bayreuth in Germany, and the other a Streugobstwiese grassland orchid in Göppingen in Germany. Another issue is the multitude of smaller and larger associations which claim to work in favor of urban horticulture. It appears the IFLA R. Urbio conference in Panama City in late October this year moves into a more comprehensive understanding of urban horticulture. This, I think, is urgently needed. Architect Anna Dietsch, director with David Brody and Pond Architects from Sao Paulo, who present the keynote. The rapidly ongoing globalization since late 20th century means that seemingly local and domestic matters are getting more and more international, and this affects urban horticulture as it does air pollution and the capitalization of banks. In Germany in the 1920s, special gardener settlements, Gartnersiedlungen, were planned in order to secure the provision of vegetables and ornamentals for a rising urban population. The overall idea was to create a fruit landscape and a fourth landscape. Pneu's idea was to produce vegetables and fruit for the city of Berlin. Such ideas did not materialize, however. Most of the people who settled there had no or only minor gardening knowledge. Even if there had been some horticultural production, it suffered from lack of watering, lack of professional knowledge, and poor soil conditions. Much later in the 1970s, community gardens in New York City and other cities emerged from large numbers of vacant, bitter plants. And even in places where one would hardly believe to find such urban gardens, they're taken care of, as I saw some years ago, in the center of Sao Paulo, Brazil, near the Praça da Sé. Here is another example from the city of Lavras, Minas Gerais. I know Brazil has a program to provide poor people in cities with homes and gardens. It's not clear to me if this is example relates to the Mina Casa and Mina Vida program the Brazilian Ministry for Cities established in 2009. In Dakar, Senegal, in Africa, women started horticulture on a traffic roundabout. It was an empty space, they just started. 
Recently, a new horticulture concept for the city of Thessaloniki in Greece was developed, and it seems to work. And last but not least, there is a growing interest to create roof gardens worldwide. And here is an example from Cairo in Egypt. And another roof garden example from the top of the architecture building at Fengxia University in Taichung in Taiwan. And it's the interest of this young scholar who asked the, the dean of his faculty, can I start operating a roof garden on the um, building for architecture? Meanwhile, it has become fashionable to build vegetable gardens on rooftops, as this 2060 Port High Gardens example from two PhD architects, Elena and Emanuela from Torino in Italy, may indicate. And last but not least, one can have a look at examples for edible landscapes at the Carrot City Traveling Exhibition. Conceived in 2008 at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, this exhibition has traveled across cities in North America, Europe, and Africa. Caroline Mays, for whom I served as supervisor to her 2015 doctoral thesis about community gardens in New York City, is active in this group. For all of these gardens, as elements of an urbanizing world, there is the need to communicate successes and failures and the myriad of issues associated with urban horticulture. In this respect, First books, then journals, and finally schools and the internet are of outstanding meaning. They are part of the civilization process with cities at its center. In 2016, the Dumbart Noakes Garden and Landscape Studies program in Washington, D.C. published in its new exporter series, 36 Views, The Kangxi Emperor's Mountain Estate in Poetry and Pins. Emperor Kangxi, who ruled from 1661 to 1722, had been interested in Western culture. And this publication from the holdings of the library at Dumbart Notes may indicate how much still can be done to come to a closer understanding of the garden cultural exchange between East and West. Another valuable tool of the Stolo volumes, which Rubens Schneider and myself were able to publish in 2009 for Italy, 2010 for Switzerland, and 2011 for Spain. And I think it would be very stimulating to see Stolo volumes for each of the states in Brazil. Maybe Sao Paulo starts. This could be a program for the next decade or so. Much later, in the 19th century, came professional journals, the transactions of the Royal Horticultural Society in London are an early example. So are the transactions of the Association for the Promotion of Horticulture in the Royal Prussian States, the first of which was published in 1824. Although academic training for gardeners had been suggested as early as 1779 in Germany, it needed the foundation of the Royal Horticultural School for Gardeners Königliche Gärtner der Anstalt in Berlin and Potsdam in 1823 to start this education. Here you see a plan for the site of the Royal Horticultural School in Berlin and a recent photo of the Perennials Garden. In the course of the last century or so, this exchange of information founded an increasing number of schools for gardeners and related professions worldwide. I am not aware of such a school in Brazil, however. You should create a scholarly center for garden culture and open space development at a university in Berlin. It is the schools, and in some lucky instances, this is from Belgium, the campus faculty for bioengineering sciences, it is the schools, and in some lucky instances, private owners like Didier Wirt, who provide libraries. This is in Percy um, and France, in the Calvados region. Schools may prepare for future-oriented architectural designs where the multicultural research is included. Since a number of years, the French architect Monsignor Calbeau presents designs which refer to urban horticulture. This is his garden-oriented residential project for Port-au-Prince in Haiti. In his dragonfly, he calls it dragonfly, but it's a butterfly actually. But in this dragonfly project for New York City, you can see the date palms when you look at this closer. You can see the date palms here. So there's this edible landscape aspect again. 
and Eric Ellenson and Dixon Desbongier, who is very active in vertical farming, have this pyramid of urban horticulture in their bag for the year 2060. In artist Joseph Klebanski's 2014 drawing, there are few urban horticultural elements. However, if you have a closer look at them, you will realize that a lot of research is needed before the giant pine trees with hibiscus flowers envisioned here will be grown. I just, I think, well, it's obvious. You see this giant pine tree, it's almost, what, 60, 70 floors high. We don't yet know how to grow such huge plants. Stimulating as it may be to create visions, they are a far cry from what is actually possible and what may prove helpful in the near future. Sometime in the future, plant factories, as this one in Japan, may produce more than edible plants. For mushrooms, we gradually get accustomed to their factory production, and so it is with tomatoes, although you will have difficulties to detect the tomatoes in this image. Local people in Tianjin, China, call this World Financial Center Corn Cup. To the left you see the brochure image, to the right you see my photo from a few months ago. Save the nickname of the building, there's not much reference to urban horticulture. Tianjin considers itself the eco-city of China. Its fairly elaborate open space concept aims at 25% open space of the city territory. Now all kinds of activities sprout in cities. Here is an example from Recife in Pernambuco in Brazil. An active woman tells urbanites in her mobile floriculture program how to grow and plant in an urban city. The lines of communication have improved considerably. The most recent Allen line of communication is the internet. It allows you to develop a conscious history knowledge. However, in order to make use of the internet, you need to apply basic skills of writing and reading. The amount of information getting available via the internet is revolutionary compared to earlier means of information distribution. Today, via the internet, you can easily have a look at the Historia Naturalis Brasilia, published in Lugden Batavorum, a place near Leiden in the Netherlands, in 1648, 368 years ago. So those with good education and easy access to the internet will shape the future, as in the scholarly world, so in garden culture and urban space development. From elementary schools to universities, these institutions help to spread knowledge about garden culture and the need for gardens as elements of an urbanizing world. As an outcome of worldwide university training, teaching and research in garden culture, international conferences and our glimpses into the latest state of the art. Such congresses are the most meaningful horticultural part of the ongoing process of an urbanizing world. Gardens offer many chances to act in one's own responsibility. They offer options for choice and allow for an intellectual exchange free from the fear of imprisonment or even the loss of life. Neither fundamentalism nor fanatism can be derived from gardening. Thus, gardens as elements of an urbanizing world indicate progress on the long and arduous path to civilized conditions of life. And with this image of a prosiological buffet and edible landscape, I close. We talk about Thank you very much.